We have tonight with us Daniel Safardi from Aplango. We have Ned Gannon from Ibrevia. John Ventura from Cash Path. Hopefully he's um, Ray Levitt from Evil Lux. Dick from Local Yoko. That's it. So with that, I'm going to start us right off the bat and get started with um, Daniel Safardi. Okay, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for being so, so many tonight. Uh, yeah, my, my name is Daniel Sarfati. I am a founder and CEO at uh, Aplango. Uh, what we do, uh, we use big data to produce some smart BI to report on how software is used. And why is this important? Well, this is very important because uh, uh, nowadays, uh, most enterprises, most employees are spending the vast majority of their time using software. So if you take into account, uh, besides the cost of the licenses, but uh, the cost of the salaries of, of all the people using software in an enterprise, that adds up to almost 40 or 50 percent of any company's budget. And um, if you think that this, pro this process has never been measured, has never been optimized by anybody, it's mind-boggling. Today this is probably the, the, the most expensive or most important line on any company's P&L, which is totally unchecked. We buy software and, and we hope that it works and hope it, it will bring um, some results to our company, but nobody's tracking it, nobody's trying to make it better. So um, with, a, in, with a, um, software as a service becoming more and more in usage, uh, since we can relate um, a license to a specific user, then it is also easier to provide the kind of feedback we want to provide. Now, with software as a service, and if, not, if you're not everybody uh, familiar with what software as a service, think of Gmail. Everyone has experience with using Gmail, meaning that you have a software which is not installed on your machine, but it's a software that you use from the internet. Well, there is tens of thousands of applications like those. Uh, one that you might have heard is the Salesforce, which is a very large U.S. company providing uh, CRM, customer relationship management, to over 130,000 businesses worldwide. And um, once uh, we, you go in the direction of the cloud and of software as a service, then companies re literally lose control. Lose control over who is using what, if a license is at all used, how much money they are spending in licenses, customers don't know. An average company which, with a budget of $100 million will typically spend between two and five million on licenses alone without the time of the people using the software and they don't know what the number is. Okay, so imagine from there to being effective and being efficient and improving the, the, this kind of process time over time has never been done before. Okay, so this is where Aplango has been created. We use big data, again, to, to provide smart business intelligence, tracking how software is being used, providing recommendation on how it should be used. And in a way, at the end of the process, shape usage, because uh, usage, if you think of it, is very closely related to behavior of employees. Assuming, of course, employees who are using software a lot. And um, so this is where we are. Uh, we integrated fully with Salesforce, which today is the most popular SaaS application, as I was saying before. And um, what we do provide is, first of all, finding out the licenses which are underused and that can be replaced or returned or assigned to other people. Think of a Salesforce license is worth today $1,000 a year per employee. And um, there are companies around here, even in town, which are spending uh, well above two or three million dollars on Salesforce alone. So savings there can be significant, but most important, once that investment is in place, you want to make sure that that is very effective to your company. And that you're tracking the process over time and you're improving it. You want to benchmark to others. So this is where we come in, by providing this kind of, uh, of detail. Um, this is a snapshot from our um, dashboard where you can see it's detail. I will be happy to explain the details if you're interested later. Um, next, we're going to, uh, to connect also to other uh, applications such as Box, Workday. These are the most popular business uh, enterprise uh, business application in SaaS today. And uh, we are going to be the first one to provide cross-application information on usage. Again, this has never been done before. There's uh, a lot of big data here, a lot of uh, knowledge and smart information we can provide to help drive how people behave and how people use this software in an efficient way. 
Uh, I'll be happy to take any question uh, later. You can catch me after the presentations. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Just a couple questions for context. How many of you know people who have ever tried to budget, maybe not you, but somebody else you know, and every now and then, they might run out of money? Just show a hand. No one? OK. So it is that, that fact that more than half the country spends more than they make, including right here in good old Fairfield County, is what drove us to create this company. So cash path is, think about the intersection of what's called PFM, Everybody knows it most commonly as Mint, and a new model in the banking industry called a neobank. That's us. And so what we're really doing is trying to wire money, to countervail the forces that make money frictionless. And the way we're going about that is by creating a technology platform that maps, spending, uh, maps cash flow forward, all of it, and then takes that and, makes, and creates an effortless, effortless experience on a mobile app for people to, to know how much can I spend today and still be good, and then ultimately transform that into a bank account that can program your money for you, almost like Jerry Maguire for your money. So that's really the concept. The second pillar of our business is partnership. I spun this out of another company that I co-founded and ran for 10 years that creates and runs co-branded and affinity credit card programs. So we've got several large leading organizations like Putnam Investments and AAA who will work with us to bring this to market to their customers, both as the app and then as a bank account. And really the end game for, um, for customers is that it actually solves the problem. And that's really the big thing that we're after. If there's, you know, people look at this and, you know, when you talk to investors and particularly VCs, they'll say, well, aren't there a million of these things out there? And in fact, there are. There are a lot of personal financial management applications. But invariably, they all follow a very similar construct, which is taking past data and then sorting it into categories and using averages. And invariably, they're therefore abandoned because they don't work in an on-the-go way. They don't give people a predictive and prescriptive piece of information that they can act on. And ultimately, they're disconnected from the bank account, and they fail. And so that's what, that's what we're doing. So the thing that I would start with, though, is I'm actually not starting with. Um, how many people here are um, investors by a show of hands? OK. So typically, we really want to start with the investors. So this is, this is for you guys. Two weeks ago, one of, one of our few competitors, a company called Simple, was sold for $117 million. Two years after launch, four years after inception. 15 million in, and the A investors made 10x. The more important point about Simple is that they are now kind of the poster child for the digital transformation of the banking industry, which is going to continue to happen over the next five years, more than five years. But it's not going to be um, sort of driven by the large banks because they're shackled, and there will be other smaller startups in this kind of intersection of neobank and PFM that will get there. So that's really the important thing for investors. I think the other thing that's critical is we slide through to the last thing here. I've covered most is that because we have this partnership model, we have a very capital efficient way to scale the business. And we have a pipeline of other partners in addition to AAA and Putnam that are ready and willing and able to go. Um, and we are in, this, in a state of um, uh, having, we have an alpha product that will very soon be beta. And if any of you would like to participate, please see us in the back. Um, and we're extending seed financing right now, if there's any interest out there, to learn about that as well. Thanks a lot. Appreciate the opportunity. And thank you to Barry and Peter and Janice for everything that they do here. Thanks. That was excellent. Thank you, John. Great job. So our next presenter is Ned Gannon, who's the CEO of eBrevia, which leverages artificial intelligence software developed out of Columbia to provide an e-discovery platform for the legal industry. Um, Ned has been one of the first entrepreneurs that actually started co-working here at the Stanford Innovation Center. 
He grew from one person to two people to three people to six people here at the Stanford Innovation Center, all co-working, all in the same space from over a year ago. And it's very exciting to see that is so with that. I'm Ned Gannon, uh, CEO of eBrevia. And as Jana said, we're commercializing some artificial intelligence technology developed at Columbia University to analyze, extract information from, and summarize legal documents. This improves accuracy and significantly reduces the time and cost associated with reviewing them. We were one of four national winners in the Startup America demo competition. Uh, CIO.com then designated the company as having one of the top 10 enterprise products at the demo conference in Santa Clara. We also received the Connecticut Technology Council's uh, Most Promising Software Product of the Year Award. We've received 565000 in financing to date, and we're also recently approved for another $100,000 grant. So as some of you may know from firsthand experience, once business due diligence is completed, much of the information required to understand and evaluate a company is contained within its legal documents. To use a fairly recent example, we can think about Yahoo's acquisition of Tumblr for about a billion dollars. As part of that transaction, Yahoo, like any other company, conducted what's known as legal due diligence, in which large teams of junior attorneys go through hundreds of legal documents. And these are customer contracts, employment agreements, leases, et cetera, to extract and summarize key provisions like change of control, assignment, and indemnification. And it's a process, unfortunately, I know all too well. I spent many nights as a junior attorney scanning the computer screen at 3 in the morning with a deadline the next day. So this legal due diligence process is extremely costly because of the hundreds and, or actually thousands of pages that need to be reviewed and the fact that you have these junior attorneys typically billing out at about three to five hundred dollars an hour. In-house legal departments are under constant pressure um, to make their own operations more efficient and reduce the amount they spend on outside counsel. And at the same time, in a buyer's market, firms need to differentiate themselves by showing they're more efficient and accurate and cost effective than their competitors. In the $92.6 billion corporate law industry, the legal fees associated with just due diligence in just mergers and acquisitions are about $1.3 billion annually. Um, about a billion of this relates to the extraction and summarization phases. Now, this doesn't take into account due diligence associated with other types of transactions, such as financings or other applications for our technology, such as contract management, document drafting, or even consumer applications. So our first product is software to accelerate the due diligence process by extracting and summarizing content from legal documents. Software is easy to use. It can analyze a batch of 50 legal documents in less than a minute. And it's not meant to replace a junior attorney, but rather to help them do their jobs more accurately and efficiently. Our target market includes law firms, in-house legal departments, and investment firms. We've demonstrated the software to about 150 uh, corporate attorneys and other professionals, all of whom have recognized its value, a uh, number have invested in the company, and the product's currently in beta testing. We'll monetize the technology through a software-as-a-service business model. We'll market the technology through bar association events, legal tech trade shows, and legal publications. And currently, there's three startup companies that directly compete with eBrevia. Our competitive advantages include the sophistication of our technology and the fact that we're the exclusive licensee of Columbia's intellectual property within the legal field. We also have deep ties to major law firms and in-house legal departments. I'll tell you a little bit about our team. I'm a corporate attorney by training. Um, I also have entrepreneurial <coughs> experience, a law degree from Harvard. Uh, our COO is also a corporate attorney by training, the founder of a profitable education firm, he, too, has a law degree from Harvard. And Jake Munt is our CTO. He previously led the research and development team at a technology company in Boston focused on extracting information in the medical industry. He has a master's degree from Columbia's Natural Language Processing Group. 
Uh, we have two advisors. Professor Kathy McEwen is the Vice Dean of Research at Columbia School of Engineering, and Jeff Muncy is General Counsel at Merrimack Pharmaceuticals. And we'll likely be raising another round, about a million dollar round of financing uh, towards the mid middle of the year. These funds will be used to market and support the Diligence Accelerator product, um, as well as to develop our second product, which is a contract management system. So thank you very much, and uh, I'd be happy to show you a demo over at our table. Thank you. Thank you, Ned. So our next presenter is somebody I met a year ago, January 18th, when he moved from Florida to Connecticut in the middle of the winter. Um, <laughs> and he is really working hard to revolutionize private luxury transportation. And he's the CEO and founder of Evil Lux, and it's Ray Levitt. So please come up here. So uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your time. I want to thank Janice, Barry, and Peter for their wonderful job they do here. Uh, once again, my name is Ray Levitt. I'm the founder and CEO of Evolux Transportation. And yes, I am surviving my second winter in Connecticut. Uh, I don't know how you people do it, but uh, I'm starting to enjoy it a little bit. Um, so let me get started. We are a helicopter charter marketplace that's developing the world's first uh, social SkyShare reservation platform. So ultimately, the way we describe ourselves is we are Priceline meeting Uber for helicopter travel. I've got an amazing team here with me today that I welcome you to come meet. Um, Matt Lally has been with me since the beginning. He's the founder uh, and CIO with us. He had a successful exit with a company called Ogme. Um, Eric West, he spent seven years um, designing and developing helicopters and advanced concepts at Sikorsky uh, Innovations. Uh, Jaren Mondry, she has been involved in a number of TV productions and brings excellent experience in video production and marketing. Uh, and Shayak Banerjee, who has a PhD from uh, uh, University of Texas, Austin. He's a data optimization specialist and he's our data scientist behind our, our, uh, our system. And myself, I have a background as being a private jet broker and I was involved in one of the early startups known as Dayjet um, down in South Florida, which was founded by Eddie Cabucci at Citrix. So this is something we've all seen and all been a part of and we just are ready to fly it over it and where are my flying cars, right? Well, uh, you know, as we know, traffic congestion is only getting worse and um, you know, you can expect to sit in traffic a little bit more every year. Uh, and we're all looking for alternatives. And wouldn't it be nice to be flying over traffic in one of these bad boys? By a show of hands, how many of you have actually been in a helicopter before? See, every time, very impressive. Well, you know, these things seem out of reach, right? Uh, it seems like it's for the most elite. Um, but what if I were to tell you that our goal is to make this just as affordable as using ground transport? I'm gonna tell you about how we're doing that. So why would you wanna use a helicopter? Well. Look how far you get outside of New York City in an hour by a helicopter, and look how far you get outside of New York City by ground transport. The value proposition is obvious. So if you were to go online right now and actually try to book a helicopter, where would you go? There is no online marketplace whatsoever. Uh, if you went to Google and tried to find the best way to get there, well, you get your car, your bus, you could walk, you could bike, and, and you could find a plane, but you can't find a helicopter. So our goal is to take all the underutilized inventory that's sitting here that is a very expensive asset because volumes are so low uh, and, and distribute this availability in real time on our platform. So what we've came up with is uh, Evolux Transportation. We're going into beta in May, and we had an alpha product that was launched in South Florida in 2011, uh, in which we started generating revenue. We really began to learn um, what features and functions needed to exist in this marketplace, both on the operator supplier side and the consumer side. And we uh, went ahead and submitted ourselves to the Sikorsky Innovations Global Entrepreneurial Challenge, in which we were surprised to find out we were a finalist, came up here and ended up winning the whole competition. So here we are uh, a year later after winning that competition and our product I couldn't be happier with and I look forward to sharing with you. So instead of providing a demo, we'll demo for you in the back, but what you begin to do is you begin to search for flights and when you start to search by flights, shared flights of other people who are trying to share that flight, those shared flights become relevant to your search. 
And what begins to happen is you begin to see other landing locations around you, whether it's a helicopter-friendly hotel or an airport, a heliport, or some excursion destination like a ski resort or a golf course or a winery. Um, you then begin to see what aircraft results are around you. You can filter by helicopter type. You can learn about the operator, see their safety ratings, see any kind of um, uh, rating system that we have in place. And you can either book the aircraft directly or you can start a SkyShare and try to set a goal to get your per seat price down to a price that's you know a little bit more reasonable. Um, so if you go through and book the Sky Limo directly, you would just go through a normal reservation process or you begin a Sky Share and this is where you start to set goals and have preferences and you begin to invite people using your social media. You can also open it up to the public and allow us to distribute the available flight for you. So the goal is, is that this is a fake reservation until you reach your goal or a threshold has been met by all the parties joining and then it gets passed on to the operator as a full reservation. Uh, the way our business model works, which this was a PowerPoint animation, so I excuse this, but the idea is that uh, our margin increases for each person that joins the flight slightly, but the price per seat drastically drops for everyone that joins. And the operator dashboard on the other end is where an operator would be able to accept the flight mission, deny the mission, or call us to talk about the mission. They could see any FAA alerts or anything that's going on uh, in their space. Uh, they can see a calendar view. They can, on the day of the flight, say it's a go, no go, or delay, which then gets communicated back to the customers. And they can also indicate where their aircraft is going to be so that they can indicate that they're open for business at a future location so that our reservation system can display their availability in real time. So the way that we went to market with this in Florida was, you know, most people associate helicopters with tours. They don't really associate it as using it as a means to get from point A to point B. So we began to partner with destinations that were excursion destinations where were very distant and difficult to get to. So there's a winery in Homestead. Um, there's an exotic car driving experience at a racetrack. And we began to market through these channel partners. And we'd like to do the same thing here in the Northeast with golf courses, get you from the city to the slopes in the day, have a great time on the slopes and get back to the city that day. Um, and you know, in this space, since we're first to market with this, the idea is that we're raising money so that we can not only be first to market in New York and do this well, but we'd like to expand to California and um, other global markets. And we're not stopping at just helicopters. We're going to introduce very light jets, turboprops, seaplanes, and the idea is that we're creating a global, I mean, a regional uh, mode of transport that's alternative to the current options. So right now, um, we have closed 250000 of our $750,000 round, and we're hoping that you would consider to, to join our team. And the idea is that we're going to not only launch um, here beta in New York, also in Florida, but then we'd like to quickly expand to California and then other global markets. I can talk a little bit about the finances in person. I got five minutes here. And uh, ultimately, the um, value proposition is that we're increasing efficiencies uh, through maximizing utilization to underutilized aircraft, uh, which is ultimately going to shift the economics in the right direction for growth and maturation of the industry. And for the traveler, we're creating an alternative, alternative form of transport, uh, which is going to maximize your vacation time and maximize your productivity as a business traveler. So the next time that you know you're faced with this, just know that you can go to evolux.com and share the skies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. So our last but not least, and truly my hero founder, <laughs> is Dick O'Hare, um, the CEO and founder of Local Yokel. Good evening, everybody. I feel like it's a little bit of a love fest for Janice and Barry and and Peter, and I will pile on to that. Uh, we've actually been in the building for a little bit over a year. Thrilled with the facility, thrilled with the support actually from the state of Connecticut, which you're going to learn a little bit about through, uh, through our company, Local Yoko Media. But uh, anyway, my background is I'm a 22-year media veteran. Past 15 years has been in digital media, uh, Yahoo, AOL, and DoubleClick. Um, so been around the proverbial block, so to speak. We got super passionate about this whole burgeoning hyper-local market. Um, and when you take a look at something certainly that I've lived with uh, in my career in the, in the media industry is, is the adage that local marketing doesn't scale or anything local with the moniker local associated with doesn't scale. Um, and it's an often cited uh, sound bite, so to speak, in the industry. Uh, that's the opportunity we're actually going after with local local media. Uh, but at the same token, the opportunity is that roughly about 80% of consumer spending happens within about 15 miles of where we live. Um, so there's a huge, 
huge market, but yet, in, yet today there is still no authentic, relevant, and scalable solution to target audiences at this fine a granularity with any efficiency at all in the digital realm. And that's the, the premise for the business of local local media. So what we're all about doing, we've built a platform that aggregates literally thousands of independent hyperlocal blogs, hyperlocal websites, examples around here could be everything from the Stanford Advocate to the Darien Times to the New Canaan Advertiser. You get the message. We're now up to over 2,000 domains across the entire U.S. We have market penetration across all 210 local markets. We're working very hard on building that. And the value prop that we that we deliver to marketers is the tip of our value spears, literally targeting the, those granular geographies through local content which basically delivers very high levels of relevancy from the advertising perspective, and the net punchline is it works. Um, we also can deploy other strategies as well, whether things from geofencing to mobile targeting to behavioral and uh, demographic targeting, et cetera, that we're very capable of doing. So we literally can help a marketer completely envelop a local community, a local uh, market that they want to do. So we are all about bringing efficiency, scale, and performance to this market is our core mission. Um, a quick graphic example here is we can deliver everything from super hyper local within a 10 mile radius say of a store location in this example it could be like the Darien sports shop and get them on their promotions on sites like the New Canaan Advertiser, Darien Times, etc. very efficiently through one platform and also deploy some of the other strategies that I mentioned, uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, we bring a lot of value to the marketers, number one efficiency but uh, uh, all levels of a lot of this is advertising speak in today's day and age of digital media, things like cross-device targeting, which is very important to big agencies. Um, and so we, we literally deliver a full spectrum of solution for them to be able to plug in and get into what I call the capillaries of, of local. Um, our management team, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've been at it for a couple of years now. Mark Labby, our CTO, is former CTO of Jupiter Media. Uh, Elizabeth Harrington, who heads up our whole publisher services side of the business, comes from iVillage and Greenopia. So very seasoned, very uh, deep in the digital DNA. Um, we're thrilled that Connecticut Innovations is actually our lead investor. So we are not only my resident of Connecticut, but huge fans of the state and not only what they're doing at SIC, but uh, Connecticut Innovations are huge believers in terms of what we're doing. So we're thrilled with them, as well as some very seasoned, extremely seasoned digital media veterans. Uh, for example, Dave Morgan has already sold two companies with uh, price tags on the co combined price tags of almost a billion dollars. So fortunate enough to know a lot of these folks from my circles in the digital media um, industry. Just a quick uh, flavor because we're actually at revenue now. We're projecting tri basically tripling our top line this year, reaching EBITDA break even by December if we hit our milestones. And the great news is we're 50% ahead of goal through February year to date from a top line perspective. So we are, as I think Janice, Barry, and Peter would, would attest, we're pretty laser beam focused on execution every day. And if my team hears me say it one more, one more time, I think they're probably gonna be sick. But it's all about execution, it's not lost on us. And um, we are in the process of potentially thinking about doing a bridge round that'll take us probably around the summer time frame, which we're treating more as a credit line to get us through this end of the year to EBITDA break even, positive profits into next year, um, and obviously continuing to grow the business from there. So appreciate being here tonight. Thanks, you guys. <laughs>